So as I said last year around this time, somebody we know has had a birthday, somebody very special, somebody very smart, somebody who was kind of a mess. If you said me, then you're wrong. Uh, it's Shakespeare. It was Shakespeare last year too. So this year for April, uh, the month of Shakespeare's birthday, I decided to read books that were Shakespeare adjacent but were not necessarily Shakespeare retellings. And I managed to finish three of those books and I'm gonna tell you about them right now. The first book that I am gonna tell you about is A Room of One's Own by Virginia Woolf. So I have a weird relationship with Virginia Woolf's books because up until recently I probably would have told you that I like Virginia Woolf's works but after the last couple of them I've, re I've read I've been like wait a minute do I like Virginia Woolf? First two that I read I liked quite a bit and then the next one I read I was like mm, okay um I think this is doing something if I, even if I don't know what it is and now this book I'm also just kind of iffy lukewarm on. The best way I can think of to describe my reading experience is this. Picture you're going to the movie theater to see a biopic of Amelia Earhart. And this biopic, although it is in fact about Amelia Earhart, is interrupted at intervals by random outbursts of songs from The Music Man. This isn't really bad per se. The Music Man isn't bad. You just didn't come here to see that. And then you get progressively more and more annoyed until you want to decapitate Harold Hill with your popcorn. Yeah, that's what the reading this book was like for me. The thing you need to know about Virginia Woolf is that her language is quite flowery and her narratives are typically not straightforward or linear. When she does this right, she pulls it off very well. In Mrs. Dalloway, for example, every sentence in that book is like a string of pearls. This book, on the other hand, is a couple of speeches that she expanded into a book and it's pretty obvious she was just reaching for fluff to make it just a little bit longer. Like it was her, you know, um, her final essay for a college class and she was like staying up at 4 a.m. trying to figure out what else to say when she didn't have enough pages. And I mean, I respect it. I've been there. But like, this didn't really make for the life-changing reading experience I was ex I was expecting given other people's reactions to this book that I know. She just, she just comments on everything from her shopping to the walk to her house to what her neighbors are doing. And I'm just like, girl, I came here for you. I don't care about them. In the end, I did get what I came for, thankfully. Wolf's central thesis here is that there have been historically fewer women artistic creators than men, not because they're less talented, but because they were never given lives or spaces of their own outside houses and children. This is something that many people today still do not understand. <laughs> So I think it's still an important message for readers today. You might be wondering why I read this for Shakespeare's birthday. The book features this kind of long form example to illustrate Wolf's point. She creates this imaginary sister for Shakespeare named Judith, who as a woman would probably not have been permitted to create even if she had wanted to. And she uses different examples like Judith being forced to raise children or get married or take care of a house that uh, would have precluded her from becoming somebody like Shakespeare. However, I do think this was a very bizarre way to illustrate this point simply because Shakespeare really did have a sister in real life and her name was not Judith, it was Joan. So I'm not really sure why Virginia Woolf made up this person and then didn't even name her the right name when there was an existing sister who she could have used as an, as an example, who did marry and have children. Also, Judith was Shakespeare's daughter's name, not his sister's. And so I was just confused the entire example because I was like, okay, are you trying to talk about the daughter of a sister? Like, I, I, why did you do this to me? But there was one part of this book that I really liked and I'm gonna share it with you. Virginia Woolf predicted incels. The poet was forced to be passionate or bitter, unless indeed he chose to hate women which meant, more often than not, that he was unattractive to them. I'll give her points for that. So anyway, I decided to give this book three stars. It was a totally fine reading experience. I think that there are still valuable arguments in it. I just think the, the obviousness of Virginia Woolf needing to expand something that wasn't that long really took a toll on the impact of, of the book. Next up is If We Were Villains by... Uh, ML Rio. This story is set at a prestigious um, sort of arts school. It focuses mainly on the theater kids 
of which there are seven in the senior class, they also have like dancing and painting and other stuff like that. The theater kids study basically only Shakespeare. Senior year, uh, there's a pretty major rift among the members of the class. Somebody gets hurt and then the rest of the book is kind of consumed with trying to figure out who is responsible for it and trying to repair or figure out what to do with those relationships. Also the setup of the book is that the narrator of the story, one of the members of the class, has been jailed for what he supposedly did to instigate this. And now that he's finished his sentence, the officer who put him there is like, okay, can you tell me the truth? Like, I've always kind of suspected you didn't do it. Like, can you can you give me more details here? And so the, the book is the guy telling his story about what happened. There's a lot here that I did like, even though the ending wasn't quite what I wanted it to be. I still overall enjoyed it, kind of. I did like that the writer clearly knows her stuff about Shakespeare and about acting courses. I went to a small liberal arts college and hung out with a lot of theater kids, participated in some theater productions, so this was kind of a fun revisit to that part of my life. Also one of my complaints with dark academia is that it's too much dark, not enough academia, because I am that bozo who actually wants to know what classes everybody's taking and what they're doing. It is possible to veer too hard into this. Uh, Tamlin by Pamela Dean, I'm looking at you. But I thought this book had a pretty good balance of dark and academia, where we actually felt grounded in what these students were doing, and it was relevant to the story rather than rather than them randomly just going to classes and not really hearing much about that. I also enjoy the writing and the narrative voice overall. It's occasionally a bit pretentious, but these are theater kids. That's kind of the definition. The audiobook reader really helped with this. It was read by Robert Petkoff, whom I adore in all of his forms. He also read the audiobook for Less, which is one of my favorite contemporary books ever. He was really good at doing voices for different characters, which not everybody does. He kept the pace pretty steady. I honestly think I would have enjoyed this book less had it not been audiobook. But what I didn't like is there were just so many contrivances that were asked to believe. In order to buy the main plot, you have to believe that one character goes ballistic out of pretty much nowhere for not a real reason. And the explanation is really just not satisfying. Like, there isn't one? It was really easy to guess, like, the mystery too. I was I was not fooled by that really. Also the the ending was BS. Uh, that's all I'm going to say. I, I don't want to spoil it for anybody but I, I know a lot of people seem to really like the ending and I don't understand how you could. Like it was kind of a crappy thing to do. I'll just say that. I have a hard time sympathizing with anybody who does that. Also not every character really got a good fleshing out and some and good motivations. That was actually a way I was able to tell who the culprit was because I was like okay if we're not spending any time on these characters then we probably don't care about them. Let's cut these people out. Oh who's left? Yep that's it. That's the person. Finally way too many scenes from Shakespeare plays like just just so many. I, I understand that they're drama students. I know I just praised the fact that we get to spend time with them as they learn more about their studies, but we just have to sit through so many scenes. I hate reading plays. I've read these plays before. I would so much rather see them. Like, don't make me do this again. I signed up for a novel. So this was fun overall, but ultimately it was just not very substantial and there were too many awkward bits of writing for me to really buy it. Last one is Morningside Heights by Joshua Henkin. So maybe you're thinking, oh, okay, she wasn't too wild about the first two, maybe this one will be her favorite. No, it was it was my least favorite. Not only do I think this book was not made for me when I really expected it to be, but I honestly can't figure out who it's made for. Morningside Heights has all the ingredients for a nice juicy literary novel. We've got the characters who were super involved in academia and obsessed with a specific literary figure, in this case it's Shakespeare, uh, one of the major characters is a Shakespeare professor and he's ridiculously accoladed and well known at Columbia University. We also have a sudden illness, in this case an early Alzheimer's diagnosis in his 50s for said professor. We also have strained parent-child relationships, strained brother-sister relationships. That's always interesting, right? Well it wasn't here. Why not? Honestly, none of these characters throughout the entire story felt like anything stronger than just types. Spence, who's who's the guy who's the English professor, we were told so many times that he's pedantic and charismatic and brilliant, but we don't see him being these things. One of the major focal characters is Spence's wife, Prue, who used to be one of his students. And even when she's one of his students, we don't get much of a sense of what he's like in the classroom. We don't get much of a sense of what he's like as a boyfriend. We don't get much of a sense of what Prue is really like. 
All these characters just kind of fall into tropes. Loyal wife, sarcastic young daughter, awkward and bitter strange son. That's it. They don't get any more interesting than that. They act pretty much as you'd expect them to throughout the story. Honestly, the most interesting characters in this book were the professor's caretaker and her son. I on would have loved the book to just be about them. Now that's unlikely because I think the author was writing what he knew, Jewish American families in New York City, and the professor's caretaker and her son were Jamaican, but still they were so much more interesting. I do give the book credit for depicting some of the rougher realities of having Alzheimer's. Uh, a lot of those moments were really heartbreaking and, and moving, but they were heartbreaking and moving just kind of because they always are. It, they didn't reveal much about the specific people that they happen to, which is kind of the entire point of a literary novel. So, you know, not mad, just just disappointed. This is this is probably getting like a 2.5 star rating. Uh, if We Were Villains was also a three um, for reference. So yeah, unfortunately, this was not a super successful Shakespeare reading month. Uh, I There are still plenty of Shakespeare-themed books left, so maybe next month will be a little bit better. Anyway, I'm going to be doing a fuller book wrap-up soon with more books that I read last month, actually the last two months at this point, and some of those I'm a lot more excited to talk about, so that'll be probably more fun. Thanks as always, and uh, see you when I see you, or when I don't, I guess. Bye!